Air sealing. Thermal bridging is one issue that's related to yet entirely separate from air sealing. Air sealing is critical. If you air seal a house, if you take the time to air seal a house, you will reduce energy consumption by up to 40%. And when I'm talking about air sealing, I'm talking about all these areas within here, and I'll break them down. Wall plates, top wall plates. Now this is anywhere where a conditioned space butts into an unconditioned space. This is true not only for attics, where second, let's, in this situation, these, let's just say these are fir, uh, first or second floor walls butting into an attic space, but conversely, first floor walls butting into an unconditioned basement. So remember, what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep the conditioned air within that particular space, precisely within that envelope. You don't want to give it pathways or raceways to rush through. These areas are especially critical. The top plates of walls, electrical boxes, holes that are bored for plumbing or electrical, chases, wires, conduit, whatever it might be, uh, chimneys, stack vents, and attic hatches. This is a really, these are all really simple areas to air seal when you're building. They're often more difficult to get to when it's all said and done, when it's all insulated, so that's why we take extra precaution during the building phase or when we're doing a gut rehab. We will go through and we'll air seal these, these areas and it's really very simple to do. All you need is a can of spray foam. Now we use a foam gun, but nonetheless, we use spray foam. You can use sealants, caulks, whatever it might be. You've got a number of options. But go through and hit these areas, particularly any holes. I mean, plumbers and electricians are notorious for boring holes up into these spaces, running a cable or a conduit through and walking away. You've just created a huge pathway for all that conditioned air to rush into the attic. That is another cause of ice dams as well, because you're releasing conditioned air into an unconditioned space. So that can lead to ice damming as well. Attic hatches. Attic hatches are really difficult to insulate properly. They used to be. What we now do is we make a box out of rigid foam and we, we place it in there. Now, that said, you need to be careful about the type of foam you use. In many uh, jurisdictions, you cannot leave rigid foam exposed. So we'll use Thermax, if I remember correctly is the brand name of one product that can be left exposed. It has a, enough of a material on the face that it's fire resistant. You can also insulate it with rigid foam and wrap it with drywall. That's another option. But essentially make it a, a, a hatch or a cover for your attic hatch. There are also commercial products that are now available and they're very effective. Sometimes you're better off making things even though, or excuse me, buying things even though you have the ability to make them simply because it's gonna free you up to do other things and it's gonna be cheaper in the long run to buy them rather than build them. Uh, chimneys are a real issue because you need to keep framing material, what, two inches away from, typically, most jurisdictions, a couple inches away from masonry chimneys. But you can use a fire rated foam and still air seal that. Knee walls, remember we've been talking about that whole, the whole Cape Cod type situation. Cape, we're saying Cape Cod house, but story and a half house. We typically try not to insulate this way on the left. We typically insulate on the right. We, we build a lot of, or we, and we work on a lot of story and a half houses. It seems to be a pretty common architectural element in the area that we're in. And we will insulate as indicated on the right. We'll bring our insulation, and whether it's a balloon frame wall or not, all the way up to the underside of the rafters. We'll bring our insulation all the way down. My personal preference is to insulate cathedral ceilings that way, even if, or even when, the interior walls come to right here because there's no interruption. You, if you look at this, there are all these jogs and there's all this potential for problems. Oh, there are all these corners. The more corners you have that you need to insulate, the more difficult it's going to be. So you got one, two, three corners here as opposed to one here. So that's how we insulate. Either way is acceptable. We prefer the method on the right. Cantilevers and eyebrow roofs are another really tricky area. Cantilevers are a really, really tough deal because you're hanging all this conditioned space out over the elements outside. This is all conditioned. This is all conditioned space. You're hanging out, this is the outside here. This, this is Mother Nature doing her stuff out here. And you're hanging this stuff, kind of flaunting her to, to come and mess with me. I don't like cantilevers, but you know, 
We, we still have to build with them. We still have to know how to detail them. The best thing you can possibly do is to insulate the heck out of this, and it doesn't actually show it on here. They're showing bad insulation with probably some type of soffit material right here. There's no way I would do that. I'm, I'm not here to, to tell you that everything in this book is 110% accurate or that, that there aren't various ways of achieving similar, similar or better results. I have a better way of doing this. We'll take rigid insulation and put it on the underside here. Here's the problem with this detail, quite frankly. This bad insulation is completely dependent on air sealing details to be effective. If you don't air seal the bottom of this cantilever, that bad insulation isn't going to do you a hill of beans. How many of you guys have torn out fiberglass insulation from around windows in particular? What color is it? It's black. Why? Dust? Air. Because air moves through fiberglass. Don't stuff fiberglass insulation around your windows. It doesn't work. It, you're not doing anybody any favors. Use foam. Use this. Not this particular product necessarily, but use a low expanding foam. The same holds true on a cantilever. You're hanging that stuff out there, and you're going to get air blowing through there. You would technically have to put the house wrap on this. You should technically be putting house wrap on this, sealing it and treating it as a wall assembly to make sure that that insulation achieves optimum R value. And you're going to have to detail the heck out of it to get it to perform properly. A better way is to go ahead, if, if you have to use bad insulation, do so, but put rigid foam on the underside and then cover it with a fire rated material. So cantilevers, avoid them if you can from the design aspect. If you're forced to deal with them, put a rigid foam panel, or better yet, put, fill that whole cavity with foam or a dense pack cell, something to stop the air movement. But it can be cold if you don't in the winter. The detail on the right pertains to eyebrow roofs. When they say an eyebrow roof, they don't mean an eyebrow dormer. They just mean a roof, that, like a porch roof overhang. I see so many framers in the new construction, when we had new construction around us, that would go, go down and build the porch roofs right up tight against the framing. They wouldn't sheathe the wall first. That wall should not only be sheathed, but it should have the weather barrier installed all the way up. You shouldn't build that entire wall all the way, you know, top to bottom, and then come back and build this detail and air seal the heck out of the outside. Come back, slit your weather barrier, and tuck your flashing up under there. You can nail everything else on there. You can nail your ledgers on there for the, the, the lookouts, for the, the rafters. None of that's a problem. Slit the weather barrier, tuck your flashing up, and flash the roof. But what you're doing is you're creating a weather barrier on the outside that's going to be very effective in stopping air movement to the inside. If you don't do that, and this isn't enough either. It says continuous sheathing blocks airflow, phooey. Continuous sheathing does not block airflow unless it's detailed properly. Continuous sheathing with a weather barrier or comparable, you know, you can use like zip tape or whatever it might be if you're using that system. Continuous sheathing that is detailed to block the airflow will block the airflow. Continuous sheathing on its own will leak at the joints. Interior soffits. This is another one. I didn't know this one for years. When we would gut a kitchen, we would go ahead and more often than not, especially in the, the 80s, early 90s, everybody wanted a soffit. We'd go ahead and we'd frame the soffits right to the bare framing. We'd gut the kitchen, go in there, put our cleat up, put a plywood fascia on, so to speak, for our soffit, and go from there. And then the drywallers would come in and they'd drywall this area right here. They'd drywall the wall, the underside of the soffit, the front of the soffit, and the ceiling. This whole area would be wide open. That's a, a great path for air to move through. So a better alternative is to, if you're framing it, go ahead and keep some whatever it is on hand. In this place, in this case, excuse me, they say seal the top of the soffit. I think actually in the book they recommend plywood. Use a piece of rigid foam, use a piece of drywall, keep whatever on hand and seal that so that there's a spot for the, the insulation to, to sit on. More often than not, you'd insulate the attic, but then you, it would drop down into the soffit. You either have to fill the soffit with insulation or it doesn't get insulated at all and it's a, a cold spot. It's a path for air as well. Another option is to go ahead and put the ceilings in first and then build your soffit assembly up to the ceilings. You can drywall your ceilings and your walls and then put the soffit framing in and drywall the soffits. It's an extra step because the drywallers have to come back or you've got to mud it twice or whatever, but it's viable. Duct work. These areas are all critical and duct tape should not be used for duct work. You can use a mastic or in, the, in our case we can use a foil back tape. Uh, someone was asking, asking me about tapes earlier and then we were talking about really tenacious tapes. This is one of them. 
this stuff is sticky as heck. And once you put it on, you cannot get it off without shredding it. So that's what, we, what our HVAC guy uses. But all the joints need to be taped or sealed. I shouldn't say taped, they need to be sealed. And not only do the joints at the registers and the ductwork need to be sealed, you need to seal them at the registers too. Because insulation is only as good as it can be in terms of air sealing. If it's not air sealed, the insulation's not going to perform effectively. So if you've got gaps around your registers and they're not air sealed, sealed some way, you're gonna have drafts through there as well. It, the details that we've talked about today are really very simple to achieve and they're very economical to achieve, particularly when you think about the cost of energy. Energy is gonna keep going up. A little investment now is gonna pay back in spades later on. I mean, tenfold, hundredfold, I don't know. It all depends on what, you know, how quickly energy prices rise. But not only that, but you're gonna have a more comfortable environment as well. Thank <laughs> you.